संचालक मुख्याध्यापक प्राध्यापक वर्ग तस सर्व मी पुन्हा एकदा स्वागत करतो आणि डॉक्टर विजय बेडेकर सरांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी आजचे प्रमुख पाहुणे डॉक्टर मायांक वाईया सरांचं पुष्पगुच्छ देऊन स्वागत करावं त्यासोबत आमची भेटवस्तू ही त्यांनी स्वीकारावी जोरदार टाळ्या वाजून आपण पाहुण्यांचं पुन्हा एकदा स्वागत करूया त्यानंतर जोशी बेडेकर महाविद्यालयाच्या प्राचार्य डॉक्टर सुचित्रा नाईक मॅडम यांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी डॉक्टरांचं स्वागत करावं संशोधन वृत्तीला डॉक्टर नेहमीच प्रोत्साहन देतात त्या संशोधन वृत्तीसाठी मी आभारी आहे डॉक्टर वाना बेडेकर व्यवस्थापन अभ्यासक्रम संस्थेचे संचालक डॉक्टर नितीन जोशी सरांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी प्रमुख पाहुणे डॉक्टर मायांक वाहिया सरांचा परिचय करून द्यावा थँक यू राणी सर गुड मॉर्निंग एव्हरीबॉडी अँड गुड मॉर्निंग गेस्ट ऑफ द डॅस अँड चेअरमॅन इट इज माय प्लेजर टू इंट्रोड्यूस टुडेज chief guest and i take privilege in doing this activity to introduce uh, mayank ji uh, he has completed his phd in astrophysics from tata institute of fundamental research in 1984 he pursued his research at tifr until his retirement in 2018 so consistency of research at tifr he worked on making and operating four space telescopes that were flown on american russian and indian satellites so i think he deserves a clap for that for the past two decades he has been interested in the history of science astronomy and human evolution his interest includes megalithic and rock art astronomy tribal astronomy and astronomy in ancient texts he has studied human migration and social evolution he initiated the astronomy and junior science olympiad programs in india and guided the astronomy program for more than a decade he is a fellow of several national and international academies he is on the governing council of deccan college pune and has also been an active member of various advisory committees of the national council of science museums after retirement he started the school of mathematical sciences at the narsi monji institute of management studies a deemed university in mumbai he has now completed that assignment and he is you know currently spreading this um, research activity you know to various students and educational participants so thank you and i welcome you sir thank you sir डॉक्टर विजय बेडेकर यांचा परिचय आपल्या सगळ्यांना वेगळा करून देण्याची गरज नाही विद्यार्थ्यांना सतत कार्यमग्न ठेवा त्यांच्याशी संवाद साधा त्यांच्यातील संशोधन वृत्ती जागृत करा आणि प्रत्येकाला प्रोत्साहन देणार असं हे व्यक्तिमत्व मी डॉक्टर विजय बेडेकर सरांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी मनोगत व्यक्त करावं मित्र अनेक कार्यक्रम अपन भेटत अनेक वेला अनेक ठिका मज मनोगत मी व्यक्त के आज डॉक्टर वाना बेडेकर स्मृति दिन अपन साजरा करते मैं एवड संगीन मैं मुलगा तरी ही एक गोष्ट घर मधे आम महती होती तो मे अत्यंत साधेपणा या सिम्प्लिसिटीला तुम्हाला मला काय म्हणावं तेच कळत नाही आणि कमिटमेंट टू द प्रोफेशन हे मला आठवत आहे की एकदा रात्री अशा बराच उशीर झालेला होता दुसऱ्या दिवशी दुपारची विश्रांतीची वेळ होती आणि कोणतरी पेशंट आला होता आणि आईने त्यांना सांगितलं बाबा संध्याकाळी या हे त्यांना कळलं 
आणि त्यावेळेला माझ्या आईला त्यांनी जो काही त्याचे जेवढे रागावले ते बघून आम्ही त्यावेळेला थोडे घाबरलो होतो की बाबा यू हॅव नो ऑथॉरिटी टू से नो टू एनी पेशंट आणि मी बघेन तू कशाला काळजी करतेस आणि मला जर का उठवलं नाही तर मला जास्त त्रास होईल सो रात्र असो दुपार असो सकाळ असो संध्याकाळ असो कमिटमेंट टू द प्रोफेशन वॉज रिअली ग्रेट वेल फ्रेंड्स आपल्याला माहिती आहे यापेक्षा अधिक मी तुम्हाला काही सांगू शकत नाही पण एक मात्र नक्की सांगेन की वेन यू गो आउट ऑफ दिस पोर्टल्स वी पी एम पोर्टल्सच्या बाहेर तुम्ही जेव्हा जाल त्यावेळे तो स्टॅम्प तुमच्यावरती पाहिजे हा स्टॅम्प कसला आहे तर हा कमिटमेंटचा आहे डिसिप्लिनचा आहे वक्तशीरपणाचा आहे आणि दॅट ग्रुमिंग किंवा त्याला तो जो काही एक संस्कार करायचा असतो तर आपले सगळे इथे बसलेले प्राध्यापक आहेत त्यांनाही मी विनंती करेन की काही गोष्टींच्या बाबतीत नॉन कॉम्प्रोमाइजिंग राहा त्या बाबतीमध्ये चलता ये वृत्ती ठेवू नका आणि ते जर का झालं तरी शेकड्यांनी हजारोंनी मुलं आपल्याकडे शिकतात त्यांच्यावरती त्यांच्या शिक्षणा पलीकडे माहितीचे त्यांचे जे काही ह्या सत्याच्या पलीकडे जाऊन आपल्याला काहीतरी एक संस्कार करायचा असतो आणि तो करणं अत्यंत आवश्यक आहे मुलंही तो स्वीकारतात पण आपण करायला हवा तो मला खात्री आहे की त्या दृष्टीने मी तुम्हाला सुरुवात केल्याप्रमाणे या पोर्टलच्या बाहेर मी याच्या बाहेर जी मुलं जातील ती तो शिक्का घेऊन जातील जे विद्याप्रसारक मंडळाचे विद्यार्थी आहेत एवढं सांगून मी आपली रजा घेतो आणि आपल्या पाहुण्यांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी त्यांच्या भाषणाला first and foremost um, i'm very grateful to the organization for inviting me to come here and uh, i've been very impressed with what i've seen about the institutions that are run here and i'm really grateful to the organization for the privilege of inviting me here i also want to begin my talk when it starts working ah huh. by paying my just one minute by paying my respects to dr ambedkar uh, dr ambedkar uh, so i will let me first start by talking briefly about what he has done he was born in um, a village in 1917 which means 100 years ago then he got his medical degree in 1941 but i think 1957 is when he chased life change when he realized that education is um, what is central to life that if you are a doctor you cure a generation if you are a teacher you cure, if you are a if you are a doctor you cure a patient if you are a teacher you cure a whole generation and many of us don't appreciate that a teacher of today um is actually decide is actually deciding what happens to the world another 50 years down the line the teachers of today are producing children or creating education and uh, which is going to last at least a generation and giving them respect giving them idealism giving them a value system in a world where value system is not as appreciated as it should be is important to have education organization like these which tell children how to think on their own how to work on their own and how to think on their own because in these days everybody is being told what to think and at that time it is good to have children who are capable of thinking on their own So in 1957 he started an organization. Then from 1969 onwards he started higher education. And today, of course, there are 20 organizations that go under the name of what Dr. Bedeka started. And he passed away in, on April 14, uh, 2004. And so I would like to begin my lecture by paying my respects to Dr. Bedeka. What I'm going to talk about today. is this idea of understanding culture several of these lectures in the past over here have been from jam kerkar subare etc which have talked about various aspects of science and culture the time the topic that i want to take is slightly tangent something that we don't think about it's slightly tangential but once you go through you'll realize that it's a fairly important part of the story so if you look at archaeology you only get how an idea about how technologically sophisticated a civilization is we really don't get an idea about the culture so if you look at harappan civilization for example we know very little about their belief systems we only know what technology they um 
so for example until the gps systems came around if human civilization had not existed or had disappeared nobody would have known that we knew general relativity because as an idea it is more than 100 years old this technology it is only about 20 years old so technology so the idea is to look at how civilization looks at ideas so intellectual growth on the other hand is a very complex entity it is a mixture of myths religion literature astronomy mathematics art etc and these things um, if you look at the any value at a given time it is mixed its value is changed its interpretation is changed its structure is changed so it is good to look at if you can look at the myths as they existed in the time at that time or religion or even literature that existed in the past then you would get a much better idea about what that culture was about today for example we all um, a lot of us follow hinduism but the hinduism that we form today is something you can't recognize from vedic hinduism vedic hinduism is so much more different than what the practices we have there is no idol worship for example and so many other things are different so if you look at hinduism today and say okay vedic people were like this is not a fair extrapolation but fortunately we have the vedic literature with us so we know what the difference is so you need to be able to see the past in the past framework and the case that i'm going to make is that astronomy will allow you to see past in their context not contaminated by our present knowledge and that's that's going to be my idea so it's it's very early human beings in fact even not just uh homo sapiens sapiens but even neanderthals etc had seem to have had this vague idea that earth is the mother and you get rains from the sky and that is how life comes and with similarity with human system they have this idea that earth is the mother the father is the sky and whenever the rains come from the sky life begins and this is an idea that is pre human in its origin and then of course like all angry short tempered fathers the sky has storms moon sun, um, sun etc and thunder rain all kind of um, kind of varying uh, phenomena which all seem to reinforce the idea that father stays in the sky so it is called heaven and um, mother earth is essentially what bears our life so this is a very old idea so sky then the visual connections patterns in the sky then become images etc great rishis great men go into skies and so on then we give stars names which are familiar to the patterns that we have because we want to remember the sky pattern and all that so this is what astronomy is about but it did not come to this state suddenly so for example if you go to hampi and if you look at some of the cave paintings that is there not in the main complex of hampi but one of the caves around it you get pictures like these and this is on a ceiling that's about um, half a meter across and there you see this very strange picture of a human being over here a kind of brightly collected sun over here bright connections over here there seem to be rays there seem to be a path in the middle and then there is partial mountain partial rays etc this we don't know what it means because the artist who drew it never documented it for us but you can see that they can have practically hundreds of interpretations depending on how, how you look at the painting or what your personal perspective is on the other end there are also paintings like these and i will come to in a minute essentially myths and astronomy are closely associated in their interrelation is is a very fascinating subject and that's what i'm going to try and talk about we will look at astronomy as first and we will talk about the myths that seem to emerge from these evidence as we go by evolution astronomy is complex and that is what i'm going to look at you can so among human intellectual growth there is of course myths literature and art there is science starts with farming but eventually takes over uh, all human activities there is architecture and then there is religion which form from the four basic uh, background uh, ideas of what we call human intellect human learning and the case that i'm going to make is that astronomy has made an important contribution to all these human activities you can see astronomy in myths you can see astronomy in religion you i already talked about father earth, mother earth and father sky architecture you will see how it is in fact run by astronomy in a variety of ways and sciences of course are a foundation in astronomy so why who studies astronomy who actually looks at astronomy and it turns out that everybody uses astronomy 
Artists, of course, like to paint their abstract ideas of astronomy. Farmers like to use astronomy because they want to know when which season is coming and when is the monsoon and when is the sowing to, going to be done. Travelers use astronomy because they want to know directionality and how to go from here to wherever you want to go. So for example, if you go to a fisherman in Mumbai and say or that you want to be smuggled into Southeast Asia, they of course won't use GPS systems and they won't use a land route. They will use a chart like this to take you from anywhere to anywhere. And from 13th century, at least, India has a very stabilized, the, the coastal communities of India have a fairly standard stabilized map of the sky, which they use in their own way for traveling along the sea. Then calendar makers obviously need to know astronomy because if you think about it, the reason why we have 12 months in a year is because um, the sun complete, uh, the moon completes 12 full moons or 12 new moons and the sun more or less returns to the same region of the sky by the time the sun the moon does that. So 12 rotations of the moon roughly brings the moon sun in the same location as it was a year ago and that is why we have 12 months a year. It comes from moon and sun. And then of course there are problems because moon goes around the earth in uh, 27 and a half days or with respect to constellations in 29 and a half days and therefore you have this adhik mass issues and stuff like that. But everybody uses calendar. Priests of course use it because they have to define the correct time for various rituals and so on. And astronomers use it because they are curious about what the sky is. So astronomy is a subject everybody uses. But the number of basic concepts in astronomy are not very large. So let me just run and bring you up quickly about what they used to see. So you have the sun and you have the earth. And we know that the axis of the earth is tilted. So for example, in June, we have summer, so summer and uh, winter in the southern hemisphere. In March, we have spring in southern and northern hemisphere. Um, Gudi Padwa essentially marks this day. Uh, April 21st, we have winter solstice in the north and summer solstice in the south. And then we have autumn. So essentially the sun goes, or earth goes around the sun. And because of the tilt of the axis of the earth, we have seasons in the sky. But if you look at this from the earth, then essentially the sun seems to go north and south. And when it is in the north, it is in the sky for a much longer time than when it is in the south. And therefore you have, you have seasons. So if you stand anywhere on earth, then you find that there is a sphere around which the sun moves. And if the sun rises to the south of east, then it remains in the sky for less time. If it start, rises in the north of east, then it remains in the sky for a longer time. So you have summer over here, you have winter over here. So Uttarayan, for example, begins in January when the sun starts going from uh, southeast, southernmost point to the northern point, and Dakshinayan begins uh, when in June when it is at the northernmost point. So from wherever you go, there's only two days a year when the sun rises exactly in the east and sets exactly in the west, anywhere on earth. And apart from those two days, you have these seasons that tell you uh, where it is. The, the, the axis of that sphere is where the north, north pole is. So Thane, for example, is at 19 degrees latitude. So the pole star will be 19 degrees above the horizon in Thane. And if you go to the north pole, it will, of course, be at the zenith and so on. Uh, then there is moon. The moon, of course, goes around the earth. If you take the sun on the left, then the sunlight comes in. When the sun moon is in opposition to the earth, uh, to the sun with respect to earth, you have full moon. Over here, you have new moon. And this takes um, uh, 29 and a half days because the, um, the, sun, the sun also moves. So if you look at it with respect to distant stars, it is 27 and a, half and a half days. But with respect to sun or full moon to full moon is 29 and a half days, which is nearly 30 days. 12 into 30 is 360. So that is how you get the concept of one year of 12 months. Um, and then you have other small concepts. You have the fact that the sun rises in different constellations at different times. So for example, if you take the earth is over here, sun is over here, you will think that the sun is in Aries. If the sun, earth is over here and the sun is over here, you will think that the sun is in the background of Leo and so on. So over 12 months, the sun visits different constellations. Those constellations are named. And therefore, we have these 12 zodiacal signs which make up one year. So 12 constellations through which the sun moves over one year are the zodiacal sign or Rashis, and um, we mark them all. Uh, then we have eclipses. 
we have planets the only the five objects in the sky the, the seven objects in the sky that move uh, sun moon jupiter saturn mars uh, venus and mercury the five objects that move in the sky and the sun and the moon the seven that make up our one week so there are seven wanderers in the sky and then there are comets and there is another very peculiar problem which is that the earth axis of rotation is not fixed so the, the, the axis point to different directions over a period of time. So there's a 14,000 year period. Uh, today it is uh, pointing at pole star. Uh, 3,000 years ago it was pointing at Tuban. And this cycle goes on. So in fact, pole star was actually a pole star only about three years ago. Now the axis has slightly shifted. So if you take a long exposure photograph of Polaris, you will see that Polaris now moves in the sky. So these are all that is there. Then because of this, uh, sorry. Because of this precession effect, there's another interesting thing that happens. The, the, the location at which the sun rises during uh, equinox time, during um, Gudipada, for example, in 10,000 BC, it was in Leo that you got your um, Gudipada. The sun was in uh, Canis Minor um, when uh, about 6,000 years ago when you got um, Gudipada. And today it is in Pisces when you get uh, Gudipada. And similarly, the summer solstice is also in different constellations. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because various ancient documents actually mention that vernal equinox was in this location. And the moment you say that vernal equinox is in this location, you know when that document was written. So for example, um, um, there's a Vedic literature which says that uh, Kritika, uh, Pleiades never, never moves from the east. And Pleiades is somewhere over here. So you know that document was written in 2000 or 3000 BC. You can actually date ancient documents because they tell you about what it means. So that is, that is the hardest part of my lecture. Now it's all easier. The simplest way of measuring anything is to put a stick in the ground. That's all you need to put. If you put a stick in the ground and if you put, do it in Thane, for example, you will notice that over a period of one year, that, uh, and if you measure it uh, say noon only, during winter solstice, the shadow is over here. During summer solstice, the shadow is over here. And then you have during one day, the shadow moves from east to west. During one year, it moves from north to south. And you have two days in which the shadow will be zero at noon. And then you have other days. That is all that you need to do. Just put a stick in the sky and look at the shadow for one day. And you will get this pattern. And then you can know what your periods are. And if you do it for a whole year, you can determine things like your latitude, zero day, equinox days, etc., without much difficulty. So, for example, in the ancient literature of temple making, it clearly says that you begin your temple uh, architecture by first putting a pole on the ground, create these images, and then you decide your east, west, north, south, and then build the temple according to what you want. Just a stick in the ground is enough to give you all the information. Uh, a lot of a lot of our Clocks, etc., come from astronomy. So hours, for example, come from sun and the moon because of sun's movement in the sky. For example, uh, example, days come from the sun. Week comes from the moon. Now, week is, is relatively a new concept for Indians. It is fortnight that's the concept for India. So Shukla Paksha and Krishna Paksha, etc., coming from over here. So there's a fortnight that comes from the moon. A month comes from comes from the sun and the moon, and a year, of course, comes from the sun. And then we have this uh, five-year cycle in which we combine the solar and lunar cycle. The sun, moon goes around the earth once in 360 days. The sun takes 365 days. So every two and a half years, you add Adik mass to your calendar so that you get the same calendar. Then 19-year cycle also comes from eclipses. Eclipses repeat themselves every 18 and a half years. Uh, if you look at Jupiter and Saturn in the sky, they mix every 60 years. And then precession, like I told you, gives you 100-year clocks and all these clocks are used in literature. The acquiring of this much knowledge alone took human beings an enormous amount of expenditure of time, resources, intellect and technology and we look at some of these issues. Cultures required to mature to various levels of um, sophistication to understand a particular phenomenon. Um, so let me divide astronomy into four different stages. There is initial stages where people just begin to realize the sunrise and the complexities with that. Then the settlement astronomy where you track the changes in the seasons um, with astronomy. Then astronomy of civilizations where astrology and cosmology, etc., et etc., et become a part of the story. And then there is technology-based astronomy 
that we are used to. Good. And we look at each of these phases because each of them gives you an important marker about what is happening. So even if you just take a picture from your sky every morning of sunrise, you will notice that this sunrise actually drifts. It is at easternmost point when it is the warmest to the westernmost point when it is winter solstice and at equinox it is somewhere in between. This is something that you can see even if you just have a tree in the house, you will see it from the shadow of the tree. So the, the first group of people who would notice astronomy are people like these. They would identify sun as a source of warmth, life and light. They would realize that the sun, um, the rain, sun and sky are our connection and they are connected and they are crucial life givers. So we call them, um, we divide the sky into heaven and earth and earth is the mother and all that. And this, like I said, comes from uh, pre-human ideas. Even before the Homo sapiens sapiens became fully human as we are, even Neanderthals we suspect had an idea of similar to things. <laughs> so, for example, Neanderthal ideas are not random. They are directional and so on. Uh, because of the elegance and importance, sky then becomes the abode where the gods live. And the arrivals of the um, first art often makes uh, is marked in stone, then you get a lot of stone out of all that. And I'll show you examples of that. And then you get settling down as the first season realized. So you get paintings like these. Well, this is a picture from uh, Kashmir, from um, Likse in Kashmir, where you see this superhuman who is controlling the movement of the moon and the sun. And this idea of the great god in the heaven who controls the movement of the moon and the sun. And this kind of uh, rock art actually is common not only to India, but to several other uh, uh, tribal people. So you see it in Australia, you see it in India, you see it in Africa, etc. Because this idea of there being a superhuman who controls the movement of the sun and the moon is something that is very profound and comes very early in civilization. Then there are interesting markers. And there's one marker I want to talk about because I think it's important. There's a stone like this again seen in Kashmir, where apparently there is a hunting scene and there are two suns. And our argument was that you cannot have two suns in the sky. If you have two suns in the sky, it means that one of these suns is something else. And the only object that can be as bright as the sun to be seen like this in the night sky, in the sky, is if a star has exploded. So we, we wondered whether this is a scene where a star exploded. So we had to look for a star that exploded, uh, which should be this, this rock art we know is older than 2000 BC. So between 2000 and 10,000 years ago, it should have been close to the path of the movement of the sun. It should have been visible to unaided eye even during daytime. And we found that there was only one object which met this need. So there was a supernova that went off in HG9, it's called HG9, 3000 years ago. It was sufficiently close that it was brighter than the moon, much brighter than the moon in the night sky, and therefore would be easily visible during the day. This is the path of the sun, and the sun would have passed through this. So clearly, you would be able to see the two of them. The question is, what about the rest of the painting? And sure enough, if you put your painting over here with slight error, you get this to fit the Orion, this to Taurus, and these two other constellations. Clearly, somebody had seen an explosion in the sky 3000 BC, 5000 years ago, and noted it down along with the constellational marking as they understood it. You actually have a date of detailed astronomical observation. This is the earliest record of human record observation of a supernova explosion dated, like I said, to 3000 BC. And because of three independent conditions, we know and the fact that it matches the fourth one, which is the constellation, we know that this is not random. Then you come to a second stage astronomy. The second stage astronomy is where people are now settled. They are farming. They want to know what is happening. They want to know what to do uh, with farming and so on. So large scale structures are created at this stage to go understand astronomy. Mega means large, lithic means made of stones. And you have these large stone structures that come up at that time. And by this stage, people, of course, recognize not only the moon, but even some planets that are studied. Constell sky is now divided into constellations so that they are easier to remember. And then you soon realize that some constellations are special because the sun visits them and these become zodiacs. And then we have the lunar mentions, which is very typically Indian. So uh, even though the English name is lunar mentions, I prefer to use word nakshatra because that is the original word for the constellations that moon visits. And eclipses are noticed at this time, and the attempt is made to determine its periodicity, etc. So, Saros cycle is defined around this time. 
transient events like comets that are also recorded. There are rock arts that, which show comets and so on. And at this stage, people start creating myths about God and human interaction. And I will talk about some of these ideas, including some cosmogonical ideas about who we are, where we are, why we are here, and so on. But first, let me talk of megaliths. Megaliths are, like I said, large structures created to, to keep track of the sun. Um, Stonehenge is an example, but I will show you there are many examples in India. These megalithic structures are gigantic structures made with great care and diligence. In Western context, we know they're astronomical. In India, we know of at least 2,000 such structures. And I'm going to take an example of one of these structures. This is in Baise near Udupi, where there is, a, there is a stone structure over here, and then there are burial sites and so on. And these stone structures are large. So you can see this young boy with a three meter stick, and the stone is clearly larger than him. In this case, there is another stone uh, which is broken. So you can see the broken part at the back, but this also must have been as big as this. So there were these huge stones. Now, why would anybody take so much labor to uh, erect the huge stones? Because if you look at the environment around it, these stones don't exist. We now know that they were brought from somewhere five kilometers away and they were dug into the ground with a specific immense effort. And if you look at these stones, you would think that they are random. There seems to be no pattern to it. But if you put them in the software, modern software and say how many of these stone shadows look, how do the shadows look? And then these black colored uh, drawings are the shadows of the stones at winter solstice. And in the red ones are the ones where one stone meets another stone. So the shadow of this stone on winter solstice goes and touches the other stone. So also this one, this, this, and this, and this. And there are many more statistically. You can show that they are much more than what would be by chance. At summer solstice, uh, sunset, the situation would be exactly reversed. And these stones would touch these stones. And the sizes and the heights of these stones are made in such a way that at sunset or sunrise, the shadow of one stone will touch another stone. So if you go and stand in the middle of it on a random day and seeing how much the shadow has missed the partner stone, you know what time of the year it is, what day of the year it is. And special days, of course, will be marked by special. Okay. All that you had to do was to go and stand there. And because these stones are large and there are errors, they seem to have made multiple of them to make sure that they get their accuracy that they want. And this is just one of the examples of um, observatories in ancient India. There is another one, uh, which is at a place called Nilaskal, some 30 kilometers from here, where they have used the mountain slope, which is exactly north, uh, east, west, and then put a stone structure on that with viewing windows and everything, which allows you to determine that. So you actually have used, so by this time, you would start using stone observatories for uh, keeping track of the sun and the moon, and you know when to start sowing seeds and so on. And then initial literature comes in. So, for example, Rukved itself and um, uh, says, so Vedang Jyotish of Rukved itself says that Yathashi uh, Yathashikra Manu Mayura Nam Nana Naga Nam Manayo Yatha Tatvad Vedang Shastra Nam Jyotisham Murjinam Sukham. Sorry, my. I can't read Sanskrit at this speed. And the bottom line is that um, just as the comb of a peacock uh, and the crest of the jewel of a serpent, so Jyotisha is, stands at the head of the, all the auxiliary knowledges of Rugved. So Rugved has, um, has a fair amount of astronomy. And more importantly, it has a, it has a secondary document called Vedang Jyotish, which actually details the astronomical knowledge. Um, so Rugved itself has um, astronomy in two parts. The, four, the, the text itself has some interesting aspects of astronomy, but Vedang Jyotish is clearly dedicated to astronomy. Uh, the second part, like I said, in the, is in the Samhita of Rugved itself, and we will look at some of these issues. Um, there are lots of uh, very scattered observations, uh, references to astronomy in the Samhita, which are more in the form of complex stories rather than direct observation. But Vedang Jyotish is completely direct. This is the constellation in which you have uh, equinoxes and so on. Tirak has done some beautiful work in Orion. And um, of course, the, in Orion, he, he gives that book the name Orion because of the constellation of Orion. And he discusses the importance of Orion in the ancient, in the Rukvedic context. And I will briefly talk about what he says. Uh, Tirak makes some excellent points about, um, about this and uh, it's um, how he argued that it's, it's really a masterpiece of literature, even after 100 plus years of uh, publication. So he talks about how astronomical references are there in India, in, in Rukved, 
going from 6000 to 2000 bc and he shows that these 6000 and earlier observations could not have been done from india so he has the second book called uh, arctic home of vedas because these observations would have been done from northern latitudes so basic astronomy like i said both rugved and yajurved have their vedang jyotish they are essentially for time keeping and ritual so they talk about duration of the year and the fact that you don't have to be 65 days in the lunar year and you have to add a big mass and so on and they talk about that and they come up with the concept of yuga which is a five year period so a five year yuga is when you have an intercalary month exactly at the same time to um, synchronize the cycle and the sun and the moon and even today if you go for a shrad ceremony they tell you that you should do it for five years because you should do it across one yuga the idea of yuga going into 100000 years is actually a much later um, change in fact somebody instead of taking one day takes one year as one day and then you simply multiply those numbers and you get the yugas uh then you have um, um tirak's uh, take so tirak has this book called orion which is on the constellation of orion and he has an opinion um where he says that a lot of astronomical observations in rugved could not have been done from the subcontinent and therefore he talks about the um, arctic uh, origin of rugved in particular he associates vernal equinox with orion he says rugved essentially was has so much of mention of um, orion because vernal equinox was in orion at that time and that gives you around 4000 bc and then there is uh, canis major on one side and uh, so on and he talks about and kritika on the other side so he says there is a discussion of kritika like i said it says kritika never moved from the east that was in 2200 bc and he earlier references is to that Taurus and Orion, which comes to four thousand BC, and then in the earlier references to a dog and the dog barks every time the heavens gates are breached and so on, and that is the Gemini, and that um, horse dog is um, the vernal equinox because the sun is now entering the new year, and that is six thousand BC. So, so, so to the east of uh, to the west of uh, Orion is a constellation called Canis Major, which is a dog. and rugved refers to the dog saying that when the sun crosses that dog that dog barks and that gives you the year starting at uh, gudi padva at 6000 bc you actually have these references in the ancient texts and then he could be he sort of analyzes that in our hand therefore he points out that um, you do actually have direct observation references to um various astronomical events and the fact that the year begins at when the sun is at a particular location uh in rugved itself then there is another astronomy so what happens in india today is that what the astronomy that we learn is a common astronomy it starts in babylonia 3000 bc and then everybody all cultures that are in contact with each other learn it so we have the same constellation whether it is in india or in europe and so on because everybody learns from babylonia the tribal groups of india are not connected they become isolated much before this astronomy comes up so each of these tribes or at least the tribal regions have their own astronomical ideas their sky is different their constellations are different their stories are different their interpretations are different it's a completely different um different interpretation of the same sky and i will show you some of these are um, really interesting and we studied about 10 tribes starting from central maharashtra to east western maharashtra to nicobar and i'm only going to give you a brief summary of what we did So, as for mainstream astronomy is completely homogenized with cultural exchanges, and therefore there is not much to be done. But isolated tribes have their own astronomy and their own interpretation of the sky. And like I said, we have looked at about ten tribes, and I am going to just show you three or four slides of that. So, Gonds, for example, is one of the largest tribal communities. And if you go and ask uh, Gonds, they will tell you the sky in great detail so we actually brought them to the planetarium in nagpur and put them in the planetarium to teach us the sky and it took us 3 days to just understand what they were talking about because they have an immense amount of knowledge of astronomy so for example to take one random example if you ask them about saptarshi this is what saptarshi looks like and to them these are the three thieves and this is an old lady's cot an old lady is sitting over here and these three thieves are trying to steal this old lady's cot and the lady's cot is made of uh, precious stones so uh, precious metals so there is gold there is silver there is uh, bronze and so on and therefore these thieves should this lady should not sleep and uh, so that the thieves can't get it today if you go there the because of precession this constellation actually sets at night but a thousand bc this constellation never set in night it always remained in the sky 
So you know that this belief and this story comes from 1000 BC, so 3000 year old developed myths of astronomy that is still very popular today. And if you look at other tribes around that columns and others, they have minor variant versions of these things. Um, and so you can actually see that they have um, these ancient myths. None of them know Polaris because there was no Polaris at that time. There was no Dhruvatara. Dhruvatara idea comes much later because at that time there was no Dhruvatara. There was no star around which the axis rotated. Then there are other beliefs. So for example, this Orion region for them is, is a whole farming scene where all kinds of things happen. To them, Leo is a constellation which is a, which is a procession of a burial. And the idea of putting a dead body in the sky is to remind you that if you're not sensitive to nature, nature will kill you. And there are beautiful stories that go around it, except of course that I don't have a time. I'll just tell you how things are different. So Pleiades is this constellation. It's a collection of um, seven sisters as we call it, but if you look at it carefully, there are many, many more. To Banjaras, who were traders until the railways came in, until about 150 years ago, they were traders who used to carry these huge jatas of material, essentially salt into the interior of India. To them, this is a piece of jewelry. To Kolams and Fasepar, who are essentially foragers of the forest, to them, this is a pack of birds. To Korku, who are essentially meat eaters, this is just minced meat being prepared by gods for their own consumption. Uh, to the Gonds, this is a bunch of stones thrown in the sky. This plate is incidentally close to the Taurus, where they have the farming scene. And because these birds are going to try and eat up their, eat up their produce, this is a bunch of stones thrown by God to shoo away the birds. To Varli, this is an oil lamp, which is lighted in the sky. And there is also a drum and a marriage procession that is, with, uh, that, um, is there. To people in Nicobar, it is either the great king looking over or it is the um, um, group of elders looking over this, um, this uh, stars and looking over earth. And they are all sitting over here. To Parthi, these are two jungle babbles that are moving around. And to the classical Indian astronomy, of course, this is the myth of seven sisters, the six of the seven sisters, as, uh, wives of um, Saptashi and so on. The same region of the sky, the same constellation, the same object in the sky looks very different depending on what your culture is and what your perspective is. Uh, so, for example, um, if you're familiar with Taurus, which is a V-shaped constellation, uh, there are various interpretations, but one particular trap, I think it was Pardi, who considered that as a trap for um, catching wild birds. And they actually make traps that look like Taurus in order to catch the birds. And then we come to the third stage of astronomy, which is uh, where you see planet, uh, this retrograde motion of planets, and there is epicyclic movement and so on. Uh, which is typically begins with the civilization and uh, settlement and urbanization and so on. By this time, the society is rich enough so that they are now begin to speculate on astronomical mythology. Who we are, we why are we? The old idea, for example, in the initial stages, Rahu and Ketu are the two demons that are eating up sun and the moon. But later on at this stage, you will have Aryabhat who will tell you that no, no, there are two nodes in the sky and if the sun and the moon come and meet there, then you get an eclipse and so on. There is astrology. Astrology, interestingly, is not an Indian science at all. You do not get reference to any major Indian, ancient Indian mathematician or astronomer talking about astrology. Astrology is an import into India from the Greeks. So it, for the first time comes in 5th century AD when Yavana astronomy is translated into India. So this idea of astrology actually is not an Indian one at all. Certainly not present till 5th, 6th century AD. It is an import from Greeks. Uh, there are omens, of course, but not, not astrology. Then there is cosmogony. Where are, who are we, why are we, where do we come from, and so on. And in the absence of any other knowledge, this kind of activity picks up respectability. So courts start having astrologers of their own because now they're worried about so much wealth that they have that they wanted to go to their children and so on. So this idea of middle class morality and astrology, etc., come into it. Uh, some of the ideas are reinterpreted and the scattered ideas are collected and you get a much more sophisticated measurement. So for example, Rahu and Ketu now become real dark planets in the sky, which you can keep track of and with which you can predict eclipses and so on. Uh, so there's an interesting mixture of religious beliefs, astronomy and architecture that comes up at this size. And essentially what you get is temples. But before I go to temples, um, <laughs> I want to show you another quirky piece of uh, 
technology. So we have Dholavira. Dholavira is a part of the Harappan civilization. Uh, 25, uh, peak between 2500 to 1900 BC. Before that, it starts at 7000 BC. Urbanization is 2500 BC. So it's good five and a half thousand years old. No written literature that is available to us. We only have archaeological data. But if you look at Dholavira as one of the sites of um, Harappan civilization, it is in Gujarat. It is exactly at uh, Tropic of Cancer near Bhuj. And Dholavira, for example, is the largest uh, site. It is at the Tropic of Cancer. And um, now it's, of course, a desert. But at the time of um, Dhola, at the time of Harappan civilization, the river sea actually used to come from the easternmost point. So the point where Bar um, India and Pakistan separate, there was an opening. And that entire region was full of the sea. So Dholavira in the middle of such a runoff cut was actually a port. Uh, and it is situated, like I said, a Tropic of Cancer, and this is what the city looks like, and there is a bailey over here, which has an interesting set of objects. So there are objects like these. And if you think, if you look, you th would think that it is just a badly constructed structure. It is not. Harappans were so precise in their architecture, there is no way they would have made a mistake like this. And if you look at this exactly like, carefully, it turns out that this is exact north, this is east-west, and if you put a roof on top of this with a little slit on the, uh, in the middle, and looked at the sky every afternoon, every noon, you could actually use this as a calendar. So it would tell you when the, when the, when the equinoxes are there, when the summer solstice is there, the sun would be overhead. When winter solstice is there, the sun would be at this edge and the shadow would move and all that. So if you look at the shadow of the sun at summer solstice, the sun would come over here, touch the exact tip, and then eventually go away into evening. At winter solstice, the uh, shadow would come at the top, um, touch over here, and then as it split, it would split from here to go exactly there. So this distance is measured and calculated to ensure that you understand the winter solstice well. So you have observatories like this. Then there are punch mark coins in India. Punch mark coins come from about 700 BC, but largely in 3000 BC is when the Janapadas, etc., take uh, hold of the second or uh, second level of civil second. Um, Arrival of civilization. The first one was Harappan civilization. Second, the urbanization is um, in the Gangetic Plain. And there you have these coins. These coins are typically a couple of centimeters in size or less than a couple of centimeters in size, but they have interesting patterns. And if you look at their patterns seriously, you actually get patterns like these. And these are, remember, a few millimeters in size. So, this anybody would recognize as the classical interpretation of the elephant, which was the earth, which sits on the tortoise, and so on. And there are a whole bunch of others where there is something in the sky even of such a small element. And there are objects like these, where there is moon and there are seven stars. And the moon and seven star or Pleiades conjunction comes every 18 years. It happens only in once in 18 years that you will see moon with the same. So clearly, these punch mark coins have been marking some of these events going back to 7th century uh, BC, or at least definitely to the 3rd century BC. Uh, then there are cosmological ideas. Who are we? Where do we come from? So in Brodharanak Upanishad, Yagnaval talks to, uh, Gargi asks Yagnaval about the universe. And so Gargi says, what surrounds earth? So he says, everything surrounded by water. What about water? He says, air. What about air? He says, sky. And then he goes on to planets, sun, moon, nakshatras, then the world of devas, world of Indra, world of Prajapati, and world of Brahman. And then yeah, Gargi says, what next? And that is when Yagnaval uses his temper and tells her to shut up for asking too many questions. But if you look at this, sorry. If you look at these, it's a fairly interesting sequence of the interpretation of what cosmology is like. And if you go to Angkor Wat, the, the finest Hindu temple in the world actually is at Angkor Wat in, in Cambodia. You actually get a sequencing of, it, it's a huge temple. It's a 700 meters by one kilometer size temple. And the central structure actually follows the sequencing of what the cosmos looks like. And the outermost region is a water temple. It's a technological marvel. And then come the temples. So temples in India arise in 500 BC as a response to the Buddhism. As uh, Bud So when Buddha passes away, they create this sepulchral structure, the stupas. And then they realize that stupas are a good place to collect people. So Hindus come out with a counter, counter argue of, of um, making temples. And that is when idol worship comes into India. And so there are sepulchral monuments of Buddhism, which are then... Um, reflected into Hinduism. So if you look at the te original text of how temple is to be made, you have Brahman in the center, and then you have Mitra and other gods on the round, and there are specific gods assigned to specific directions. The whole idea of the center center of the temple actually is an image of the heaven on earth. 
and then there are of course uh, two types of temples you have the you have sorry you have um, this uh, dravida style and the nagara style in nagara style this is the most important part of the temple and the big dome is right on top of it in in uh, in um, dravidian style of temples uh, the dwarpals are the most important so minakshi mandir the outer regions are most important but the garbhagra still follows this pattern and then like i said because of precision you can date documents so rugved for example according to tirak goes from 6000 to 2000 bc uh, brihat samhita which says where uh, rohini shakat ved happened comes to about 5000 bc yajur ved um, uh, which talks about vernal equinox in kritika comes to 2300 bc yajur ved uh, vedang jyotish which talks about the summer solstice of ashlesha comes to 1370 bc lagada gives you the latitude of shravishta which comes to 1340 bc mahabharat which has a saptarshi calendar uh, which again comes to 1200 bc and then parashara samhita which describes constellations and all that comes to between 1100 and 1300 bc so these are all 3 to 5000 year old literature but you can actually date this literature based on astronomy and then we have technology based astronomy i neither have the interest nor the time to pursue it in detail over here but like i said if you go to a, a fisherman today and say i want to sm be smuggled to doha dubai or something he will take out a chart like this from dubai and he will tell you that you follow this pattern in the night sky for so many nights and then he will reach another port will take out another map and eventually take you to two or three changes to wherever you want to go and these are 13th century maps which are still being used and and there are interesting stories so for example um, one of the major shipping companies of india lost one of its ships because it got entangled on an island going from here to dubai and the western technology told them that you can't pull it out you have to throw away the ship so before dismantling the ship they went to the fisher folks of mumbai and one of them pulled out a couplet saying that on a particular day of the year at that particular location the tide is maximum so they actually waited for that day to come and they managed to pull out their ship which would otherwise otherwise have been destroyed so there's a lot of traditional knowledge here uh which is not been documented in this case it is documented but a lot of it is not documented beyond a certain level of sophistication in astronomy to become specialized now you have specialized teachers so the state gives grant to the great teachers of uh, astronomy and you have um, um, vidya peeth and you have uh, guru shiksha uh, versatile guru shiksha systems guru shishya systems and so on and a lot of mathematical astronomy comes in in india this starts with aryabhatta 500 ad and then it peaks at 1300 ac with uh, kerala school then we go through dark ages and then comes the modern period uh, from this the astronomy is now more integrated worldwide so aryabhatta works is immediately known to arabs and eventually to europeans and so on and similarly arabic ideas come to india and so on so sun dial uh, this uh, various technological instrument come to us from arabs Well, a lot of mathematical astronomy goes from India. Zero goes from India at this time. Ah, uh, so this is the Siddhantik astronomy, 500 AD, when Aryabhatta himself says that, "Look, I am writing down as an encyclopedic book. This is not my personal knowledge, but this is all the knowledge of astronomy that I have, which I am now writing in a book." And he writes the encyclopedia. He also writes uh, sine functions, trigonometric functions, etc. Come up at this time. Ah, uh, the preoccupation of Indian astronomy for the next millennium would remain the calculation of ge uh, geocentric. Uh, planetary orbits and they work on algorithms to determine uh, these uh, locations and so on in the 3rd century uh, they also come up with ideas of trigonometry and trigonometric function and there is a single single slope which will allow you to measure, calculate the value of sine of a function for any given angle difference angle. and all those things come in here for convenience he also has a lookup table of prime, uh, sine function and so on and then we have mathematical formulations um, sine functions come up eclipses calculations come in uh, planetary uh, uh, look, uh, locations are calculated with great measure and astral charts are made at 13th and 14th century uh interestingly um varamira defines who an astronomer can be at this stage and his syllabus is straight forward he says you should know division of time you should know the planetary calendar you should know terrestrial calendar you should know solstices eclipses you should know annual motion of the sun and the moon you should know latitude and longitude at any given place ujjain was the zero longitude at that time from india it goes to paris and eventually to greenwich um yeah so you should know nakshatras and zodiacs and so them in the sky 
and teach this to a smart school. Interestingly, astrology is not mentioned. He does not talk about being able to predict uh, what happens on earth based on astronomical knowledge. It's a pure uh, knowledge system which is to be pursued just for the pleasure of it. And then we have Jantar Mantar that comes in and eventually modern astronomical tools. Um, so astronomy today is uh, modern astronomy. It has many more inventions. It has inventions of telescopes and other instruments. It also goes beyond just optical light to um, infrared to X-rays and gamma rays. Uh, physics comes into picture and you get astrophysics. And then you have satellite astronomy, which goes beyond the atmosphere. And together we call them the subject of astronomy astrophysics. But its roots are much older. Uh, so we have these four phases of astronomy that I talked about, initial phase, settlement phase, astronomy of civilization, and technology-driven astronomy. The bottom line of what I've been trying to say is that it is possible to create a map of intellectual growth of a culture using astronomy as a core. Uh, the growth of astronomy occurs in distinct, sorry, distinct stages and that you can keep track of. And archaeological evidence uh, does not show these dramatic transitions, but if you look at it carefully and interpret it properly, Astronomy actually is an excellent window to understand. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, sir, for a very interesting and absorbing summary of the astronomical uh, study and development uh, throughout the Indian history. Okay. Now, sir, it, it was very fascinating to see uh, what all developments took place. But uh, as we all would know and agree that astronomy as it was studied, uh, if it was accurate, then there is one uh, set of facts that come in front of us. But in case of even slight inaccuracy, there can be some misbeliefs. Uh, no, no. The, yeah. Considering all this, where do you think it has brought the Indian society? Yeah. The study of astronomy as it was done, has it helped us or has it restricted us? This is one question, sir. And the other question, uh, Okay, sir, I'll listen yeah. to you. Um, yeah, I'm, that's a very, very, very leading question, but I'm going to be led by it. Astronomy and astrology are not related in the sense that if you go to an um, astrologer today, they make a kundali for you. That kundali is accurate in the sense that they tell you that moon was in this place, in this constellation, sun was in this constellation, so that they use standard astronomy calculation. The problem comes when they start interpreting it as having an effect on human life. And there, it is completely nonsense. In the sense that, um, first of all, I don't even know when I was born. Was I born when I was conceived? Was I born when I was I left my mother's womb? Or when did I was I exactly born? And my mother was probably in labor for eight, nine hours. I don't know when I was born. So that is one issue. Second issue is Jupiter, Saturn are themselves very far away. And they are not bothered by what happens on Earth. And the stars and constellations are even further away. There is absolutely no way any of them will have effect on life on Earth. It's a very insignificant event, event from astronomy point of view. Even then, science can have something that science does not know. I mean, there may be some truth that science does not know. So the obvious thing to do is to test it statistically. You give a Kundli to, same Kundli to 10 astrologers, they'll give you 10 different interpretations. And then you go and check what happened to that real person. Several such tests have been done, and I have not listed them here because of lack of time, but it is repeatedly been shown that astrological predictions come out to be inconsistent within themselves, and they certainly do not predict the life of any person in any real sense of the word. So astrology definitely is not science by any stretch of imagination. Like I said, no great Indian mathematician has ever supported astrology. The second point is what it has done to society. I think it has done a lot of serious harm. In the sense that a lot of people who, we are all scared of our future, let us face it. We are all worried what will happen to us tomorrow, what will happen to our children, whether the wealth I'm creating, whether the house I'm building will catch fire and get destroyed and all that. So we all have fears. Astrologers essentially play on these fears to claim that they know what they do. 
and i would ad very strongly advise you to go to an astrologer and just listen for the first 20 minutes and you will realize that he talks in very broad general meaningless terms trying to trap you and then at some stage he will say something must have happened to you in year 927 what 2020 or something and then you something would have happened no a year is a long time and then you would say yes yes i had that trip and fallen down ha huh. this kundli tells me that you had fallen down at that time they essentially are smart psychologists they should all get degrees in psychology not in astrology so astrology is a dangerous two internally inconsistent scientifically impossible and repeatedly shown to be impossible and one of the greatest tragedies today is that government wants to introduce astrology as a course see when you go to an india anybody will know that if you go to an india usual astrologer there will be people who would have been failed by him so we all think that astrology with that astrologer doesn't work the moment government gives degree in that subject people start think that maybe all these problems have been eliminated and this particular fellow is ignorant but astrology is correct it is not it is not correct that any stretch of imagination so please do not believe in omens please do not believe in astrology you can see evidence either if you, you can write to me and i will show you all the evidence that exists there till the point of writing kundli they depend on astronomy to then they are correct but to say that it has a specific effect on human life is impossible i mean there are what 1.3 billion indians which means 1 billion indians have the same fate every day because we have the same zodiacal sign it makes no sense it is completely totally absurd it has been shown to be absurd it is shown to be non believable and um, it is a great tragedy that the government of india would want to introduce that as a subject of learning it is not learning it is superstition okay thank you thank you sir um uh, and coming back to the topic of astronomy where do you think our study of astronomy stands uh, compared to the other ancient civilizations like the mesopotamian mesopotamian or the egyptian or chinese okay. uh there are two or three things the original constellation designs and the original uh, sky actually is not indian it is mesopotamian so in 3000 bc just before the harappan civilization the mesopotamian civilization divides the sky into constellations which we follow today so we were not the first one of the game but we have been more systematic and sustained for a long period of time when it comes to aryabhat's mathematical formulation of um, of um, astronomical uh, calculations they are phenomenally precise so greeks for example had this vague idea that because of the fact that moon suns moon uh, mars seems to have retrograde motion there should be a cycle on a cycle and epicycle that vague idea exists in greeks but its systematic working exists in india because that is where you have the mathematical tools so as far as creating mathematics and mathematics why you lot of documents are there are uh, to show that indian mathem astronomical ma mathematical astronomy was phenomenally ahead aryabhat in fact goes to great lengths to insist that you should keep connecting this to observation astronomy he says look I, so varamira for example gives you a formula to calculate um, vernal uh, vernal equinox okay godi padwa de and um, that equation is valid only for about 4 500 years around it because of the precession and aryabhat has an idea or varamira has an idea that look there is precession which will produce errors in this but we over hundreds of years and i don't have that data so he insists that people should keep observing so some of the best practices recommended are forgotten and that is why we have that is why today's astrologers when they create a kundali they do longer depend on surya siddhanta for calculation they claim to remain depend on surya siddhanta but they look at the ephemeris which are produced by indian statistical institute in calcutta so at the beginning of uh, soon after independence um, nehru and all recognize that we need a proper hindu calendar so the indian statistical institute calcutta bring out uh, ephemeris locations of each planet as a function of minute as a function of one minute and they use that for plot so they're using modern science as far as mathematical indian science is astronomy is concerned i think india has done phenomenally well but we were not the first of the base okay. thank you thank you sir and one last question for the benefit of all our students if any one of them wants to take up astronomy as a subject apart from your institute tifr which are the good institutes in india okay um i think the first thing you should realize if you want to take astronomy as a career is that astronomy is a branch of physics so until you are you do you can do hobby courses you can read astronomy you can do all kinds of things till then but please focus on studying physics and mathematics those are the core of 
astrophysics. Astrophysics is an applied, astronomy is an applied branch of physics. Amongst all the physics, some of the ideas are used in astronomy. So till at least till graduation level, you should seriously do only physics and mathematics. You can follow astronomy as a hobby, go to planetarium, go to various institutions and so on. Uh, but concentrate on physics and mathematics to graduation level. Then for a master's, you can go to either, even Mumbai University has an MS in mathematics, in, uh, in astronomy, but any of the IITs, et cetera, are good. There are a whole city set of new institutions called ICERs. In 60s and 70s, when India needed engineers, we had IITs. Five years ago, I think approximately five years ago, government of India realized that we also need scientists for the future to develop our scientific um, industry. So there are a whole bunch of ICERs that have come, four or five ICERs have come, Indian Institute of Scientific Research and Training. The nearest one is in Pune, but there are five or six of those. Those specialize in training you to be researchers in um, which are physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, etc. So those are good institutions. But I would suggest focus, even if you, I, I'm, a, I'm a completely Mumbai University product. I did my schooling in Mumbai. I did my BSc in SIES. I did my master's in Mumbai University and I did a PMI PhD from TIFR. So it is not that by the time you come to MSc, you realize, by the time you leave school, the moment you leave school, you realize that now teachers have changed roles. Teachers are now conveying information they are not teaching. The kind of interest that your teacher took in your school where they knew you personally, where they were worried about your individual development no longer exists. Now you're on your own. And that is the biggest cultural change that a student sees when he goes from school to college, because there is no focus teacher. So for example, all kinds of things happen. But anyway, uh, the bottom line is at that stage, then you have to take charge of yourself, saying that whatever the syllabus, I want to learn my physics and maths and learn it well. And it is entirely your personal initiative. Your friends will laugh at you. They will call you a nerd. They will call you bookish, whatever they call it. But a good investment in maths and physics at undergraduate level is crucial. And I can assure you that in my entire life of 65 odd years, at least, even if you subtract first five years, 60 years, I've never seen a born genius. Nobody is born genius. Or everything is a question of commitment. All genius is 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration. But that 10% inspiration will not come without 90% effort. And don't let anybody confuse you saying that they are superior to you. They are not. Intellect wise, I don't think any of us is distinguishable from the other. The only thing that distinguishes us is the commitment that you make to learning what you want to learn. If you are committed to learning sciences, there is no way you can go to evening parties and do it. You can be a part-time engineer. You can be a part-time doctor, but you can't be a part-time scientist. It's a full-time obsession. So think before you want to do it. But once you want to do it, Please give your full to it, otherwise you will not succeed. Nobody, again, I want to repeat, was a born genius. Einstein was dumb and almost thrown out of the school at an age of 13 because he just couldn't read or write. But he had an uncle who taught him mathematics and he fell in love with mathematics. And then whenever he came across anything that was told to him, he wrote it down in mathematics. And that's how he went to where he is. So in TIFR, for example, when I joined TIFR, we used to have two levels of interviews. And when I was sitting for the first level interviews, a bunch of Delhi students came and asked me, I said, I want to do astronomy. So they said, do you know about neutron stars and do you know about pulsars? And I did not. I just knew I had interest in astronomy. So they said, I know everything. Why are you wasting my time? You go away. And I said, anyway, I've come here. I might as well appear for the interview. None of those students made it to second level. And I, of course, spent 40 years in TIFR. The bottom line is that there are no superior things. It's a question of your honesty, commitment, and hard work. And every piece of hard work will pay off. There is no such thing as wasted knowledge. You learn, study as much as you study. And education is one field, or studies is one field where the more you put in, the more you get out of it. And that's where the fun is. So it's a great field. By all means, go into it. India has many, many beautiful institutions. Tata Institute is one, BRC as astronomy. Um, Indian Institute of Astrophysics is there. Indian Institute of Science is there. India, the world's largest radio telescope is in India. One of the one, three, one very large, two very large optical telescopes are in India. Um, India makes some of the finest astronomical telescopes and so on. So there's plenty of scope. There are plenty of job requirements. There are plenty of great institutions. And going through IIT, et cetera, helps a little because they force you to study. But really, if you're self-motivated, Mumbai University is as good as any other place. So the idea is only your commitment and how much you're willing to put in for it. And the more you put in, the more you will get out of it. And never believe in anybody being born genius or superior to you. They are all slogging. You have to formally learn your formal knowledge, understand it, and absorb it. 
and then you will move ahead. And remember that a subject like physics is everywhere. It is not just in the question of classroom textbooks. Okay, this light is emitting light, for example, by stopping electrons from moving. Everywhere that you get light, somewhere a charged particle is being stopped by somebody. Either it is by a physical object, it is by magnetic field in your in your old cell telescope or in your old cell TVs and so on. Everywhere that you see, there is physics to it. And if you start appreciating physics everywhere, you will read more physics everywhere because there will be places where you will be confused. And that will set you on a path of being a great physicist, a great scientist. And if you want astronomy, astronomy. But the idea is just commitment on yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You you really given a telescopic view and vision to our students of what to study, how to study, and where to study. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, what? Yes. Can we take some questions? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for the beautiful lecture. My question is: We seem to have good cosmological or uh, uh, observational astronomical data in our literature and mathematical astronomy also. But do we have astrophysical data as well in our ancient literatures? Um. No, in the sense that we did not, Even. we called st stars as Jyoti, but we really do not know what that source of Jyoti is. See, there are fields of sciences that India completely missed out. And the reason I don't know whether I have time to do all that, but Indian logical thinking is slightly different from Western thinking. Our thinking is inductive. Okay. And um, um, Western logic is deductive. So when they see something, they want a physical reason why that happened. Indians are happy with mathematical formula. So even the epicyclic idea comes into India along um, more or less the same time as Europeans are working on it, we don't end up with gravity. But they end up with gravity. So they feel like gravity, thermodynamics, electromagnetism, etc., which India missed. Okay, I mean, one can talk about social commentary on those things, but I want to avoid that. But those fields India missed. And once India missed those fields, uh, there was no way we were going to get down to astrophysics because astro all these things leads to astrophysics. Good afternoon, sir. Yes. Oh, sorry, good morning. Good morning. Uh, sir, as you have mentioned on your web page, uh, you have recently uh, generated curiosity on uh, archaeo astronomy. Yes. Uh, what makes you curious about archaeo astronomy? <laughs> um, sir, the first thing is that um, I was trained in classical astrophysics. Okay, so I did my PhD on what are solar flares and stuff like that, and I was working in high energy astrophysics. Then I went to planetarium for a year in 2000. And people would ask me about Indian astronomy and I didn't know anything. So I was very ashamed of myself. So I started studying. And then one thing led to another. So all this tribal astronomy, megalithic astronomy, which have, which have been part of my studies, even Saptashi calendar, etc. We have studied. But that is because once you are curious, you are curious. You see, the thing, the interesting thing about nature is that if nature appears to be in one way, in a one particular perspective, it is good to look at the same thing from different perspectives. So different windows of knowledge will give you different perspectives. And if they are not internally consistent, you have a problem. It's like four men, four blind men and an elephant. One of them thinks it's a tube. One of them thinks it's a, it's a stump. One of them thinks it's a snake and all that. But the consistent picture you will get only if you open all these windows and see. So that is why we were forced to go everything from uh, scriptural astronomy to tribal astronomy to megalithic astronomy and so on, because we wanted a comprehensive view about how astronomy is. But it is a question of curiosity and I must largely credit my institute, which never asked me why I'm doing what I'm doing. And the nice thing about TFR, which is a very rare anywhere else, is that we don't have projects on which we work. We are taken um, based on our quality of uh, understanding of science. And initially you work with your PhD guide, which is on a specific problem. But then TFR asks you to do whatever you want to do. The only criterion is that every year they will show your work to somebody who you don't know internationally outside India. And they should certify that you are not wasting your time and that you are doing something genuinely. You are actually genuinely adding to the knowledge of the people. If, you, if that comes out negative, then you are in serious trouble. But uh, as long as the international scholarship says that this person is pursuing a good scholarly study, you are safe. So TRFR, even though I was doing high energy astrophysics and making telescopes that went up in space, at some stage, I said, I want to study history of astronomy. And they asked me how I was going to do, had it vetted by some international group. And then they said, okay, go ahead. And they gave me some funding and said, so TRFR should get a large amount of credit for what I've done. Yes. Uh, 
uh, any particular uh, topic that you like most in RQ astronomy? It depends on the day of the year. In the sense that when I go amongst tribals and study the tribal astronomy, it's a beautiful experience. So much excitement, so much knowledge, so much of interpretation is there. On the other end, when I go to a temple, I just marvel at the astrono megalithic astronomy of temples. So that depends on uh, which time of the year, where I am. In Dolavira, if you go and once you realize that there is an observatory there, your entire world perspective changes. So I don't have one particular favorite. My, which one is favorite will depending on where and when. I mean, what is my mood that day, basically? At Poha Khaya, to I like uh, Sanskrit astronomy. It's a beautiful memory that you can share with us. Tribal astronomy, sitting amongst the tribals. So, um, okay, now that you've asked me this question, and I hope I have time. Um, how do you study tribal astronomy? Because if you go to a tribal who is working with you, who has come from that village and working with you, he's completely modern. The current generation of children are all completely into modern education, and they have complete contempt for their parents' learning. All children have contempt for their parents' learning. That's fine. The problem is that they are forgetting their older knowledge. So we had to go and look for villages which were so isolated that modern education had not touched them. So we took a taxi from, we took a car from uh, Nagpur and we would start in the day, look for villages that are really, really far from. We are, so India, Maharashtra, India has forest which are protected. Then there are inner cores of the forest, forest and there are innermost cores of the forest where nobody is allowed to stay except those original inhabitants, Adivasis of their part. So you go to identify villages which are essentially Travel that that takes some time. Then you have to build up a repo with them, saying that we are not dishonest people trying to grab something from you. We are here genuinely as students, and then you learn from there. And once they open up, it's one of the most delightful experiences. Many are of course enthusiastic and excited because nobody has ever asked them the stories that they had learned from their grandparents. And we have had youngsters coming and telling us, um, it was quite surprised to us, expressing great gratitude to us for uh, preserving the knowledge which they are losing and all that. So those are touching experiences. We went to Garchiroli, for example. So Garchiroli is in the middle of communist uh, uh, Naxalite movement. So we said uh, we want to go there. So we asked the local police fellow, police fellow says, we refuse to give you any support and we refuse to know you. You go there. <laughs> After you come back, you give us a call. And if I don't get a call in 24 hours, I will send somebody to search for you. But otherwise, I refuse to take any responsibility. And if you have any government identity card, please hide it. Do not give your identity. And so we went to this Garchiroli village, etc. And sure enough, two kilom three kilometers before we reached the village, there were four people on bicycles and uh, not bicycles, motorcycles and uh, AK-47 and stuff like that. And they came and sat with us. They noted down what we were asking. They noted down what we were writing down. Each of them sat next to one of us who was taking notes, etc., and then escorted us out of the village. And then we came back and told the police fellow that we are safe. But those are experiences that you have. If you want to learn, somewhere you have to take a risk. Question, sir. Uh, as your team is a part of AstroSat uh, team, yes. uh, which ISRO has sent it to orbit, uh, what kind of uh, information you have got through AstroSat and what will be the next step for the AstroSat 2? Okay, so AstroSat was the first. Um, dedicated astronomy. So now before Esther said, I, now that we are talking, I was talking about ancient knowledges, there's also an Indian ingenuity. So, so for example, we built an experiment that went on the space shuttle, NASA Space Shuttle 1986. We, there we wanted an aluminum foil, which was just 75 microns thick. And no engineering company would make it, not BRC workshop, nobody else would make it. Um, and certainly you could not import it because nobody abroad also had that technology. So we put up a general tender saying, anybody has an idea, come forward. So one IIT graduate, I think he's in Mumbai, he came forward and said, I will do it. And what he did was, but he said the wastage will be more and we'll have to bear the cost, which we agreed with. So what he did was to make a wooden dome exactly of the same size as our requirements were, put an aluminum foil, which was slightly thicker, and then literally bursted Diwali crackers. And in nine out of those 10 bursted crackers, spoiled the foil, it tore the foil or something. But one in 10 came out to be good. And we needed only five pieces. So eventually creativity is not a um, monopoly of anybody else. This Indian engineer who did it, I don't know what he's doing now, but actually managed to create that no something that no engineering form anywhere in the world. Was. We were even willing to take a thick slab of aluminum and etch it down, but it would not work to create holes somewhere because etching is not that uniform. Only this gentleman managed to give us the dome that we did by bursting Diwali crackers under an aluminum foil, something that nobody else thought of. 
we had also gone to BRC workshop and tried to get it done. Our workshop couldn't do it. So it's a question. Ingenuity is not anybody's property. Uh, having said that, you asked me about Estrosat. So Estrosat has uh, produced a large number of insights into, um, okay, before I just, just give you to give you a brief about what this elephant called Estro, um, Estrosat is, what we have is that Americans are far ahead of us in uh, satellite technology. There is no doubt about that. So they have a specialized telescope which looks at uh, gamma rays from stars. It has a separate telescope that looks at X-rays from stars which is called Chandra. And they have various observatories for individual wavelengths. And there was no way we were going to compete with them in technological sophistication. So what we did was to create what is called a multi-wavelength telescope. It is the same telescope on which you had optical telescope, infrared telescope, X-ray telescope, gamma ray telescope, okay? Which is what made it unique. So it is the same elephant in the, um, four blind men in the elephant, the American telescopes were giving us each one wavelength. So somebody was saying some object was in, uh, was a pillar, somebody said it is a snake and so on. What Astrosat did was to give us multi-wavelength observations simultaneously of an observer. So we know a lot more about the astronomical, uh, astronomical um, integrated astronomical thing. That if something is happening in optical, that same time, this is what is happening in X-rays and this is what is happening in gamma rays. Americans couldn't do that because their optical telescope was looking somewhere, gamma ray telescope was looking somewhere. So in multi-wavelength astronomy, as far as high energy phenomena in various stars and galaxies is concerned, Estrosat provided us with a lot of new insights. And so, for example, for the first time, our telescope saw material disappearing behind a black hole. So you could see material that was outside the black hole, which was fairly warm, and then it would become hot, 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 and become narrower, 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 and then suddenly disappear. In, astro in sciences, nothing can disappear suddenly. Even if you switch off a gas or even if you switch off a light, it has a certain decay time. Here we saw things that were disappearing without any decay time. And the only way that can happen is if it is going beyond or behind a curtain. So for the first time, we showed material disappearing into a black hole, which was what we have not by astrosat, but an earlier telescope from us. So there are various observations about high energy astrophysics which have come out because of its multivariate capability. And I could list out all the papers. It's already. 10 to 10. One more thing, sir. As you have just mentioned about the black holes, uh, can we consider black hole as the first doorstep of a parallel universe and why? No. Parallel universe, first of all, as far as we know, time does not. I mean, sit down. What do you mean by parallel universe is the question? First question. Parallel universe means the universe which, uh, which is the same as our universe, but it acts as a different leap from our side. Like no, no, if you have an identical physical universe as ours, um, and if it is not contactable, it means that the object is moving away from you at velocity greater than velocity of light. Because as long as the velocity, if the object is such that I can send light there and bring it back, I know what the universe looks like. There are two physical ideas of parallel universes. There is one physical idea of parallel universe which says that when the universe was born, we have uh, the universe with the electron charge is so much, proton mass is so much, whatever, whatever. There is no physical rule why there should be the numbers. So I can imagine another universe where the proton is heavier or lighter or electron is heavier or lighter, etc. I can do that. If there are those parallel universes which happened at the Big Bang, that there was one universe with these values of these parameters, there were these values of those parameters, then we cannot communicate with them in any way. So they, don't, they only exist in metaphysics. They don't exist in physics. If you are talking about universe that is time disconnected, where we can't see what is happening, it doesn't, we don't, can't see it. As far as black hole physics is concerned, as far as we know, time stops in black hole. It does not change dimension in any real physical sense that we can understand. So as far as we know, astro, astro, astrophysicists talk about all kinds of things. They even talk about string theory, which we don't even know is true or not. But in physically, experimentally, as far as we know, black holes simply freeze everything inside. And there's no question of parallel universes for that. There's another kind of parallel universe idea that the, anything that black hole falls into a black hole comes from somewhere, comes out somewhere else, etc. But none of them are physically verified. So they are, they might as well be astrology. What we can say about uh, white holes? Say, but they don't exist. There is no experimental evidence of any white hole. White hole is a material that opposite to black hole when material comes out. We have never seen anything like that. Uh, white hole con uh, only engulfs things which has energy. Am I right? About no, no. Anything has energy. Everything has energy. As long as there is mass, there is energy. Everything has energy, but 
to think things which uh, black holes consider. Uh, yeah, let me put it very bluntly. Black black holes are objects which are whatever regions from which escape velocity is more than velocity of light and the density is abnormally high. But there is no corresponding object from which there is no white hole in the universe. Black hole also has energy. Okay, it obviously has energy, but um, because it has mass, mass has energy. But there are no white holes in the universe. It is not even serious science, in fact. The reason why I'm not giving you a very long answer is because the rest of the audience won't be interested. Yes. Yes. Sir, uh, my question is, uh, what are your views regarding the uh, laws of uh, astronomy portrayed in uh, science fiction movies? The only example I want to ask is uh, Christopher Nolan's uh, movie, Interstellar. Since we were talking about bla black holes, it yeah. reminded me about Interstellar. Okay, Interstellar um, has, in some sense, there are problems, in some sense, there are none, in the sense that you, you faster than tra travel faster than velocity of light we know doesn't exist. Einstein's ru Einstein rules. Velocity of light is the ultimate limit. As far as their images of black holes, etc., are concerned, they are fairly accurate. Those simulations are really very precise. And we have now seen astronomical photographs where those black holes are seen. But the idea that you could be at one place and one time and it communicated velocities faster than velocity of light, which is internal to, uh, uh, to uh, this um, interstellar is something that we know we do not know if it is true all our experiments have shown that it does not it is not possible every experiment that we have done to try and falsify and what einstein did turn out to be false so einstein holds and as long as einstein holds velocity of light as a final arbitrator of velocity if information exchange holds the only place we have a problem is in quantum mechanics but I, that's at a very small size scale it will not work on interstellar dimensions yes Anything else? Yes, there is a question at the back. Um, I think, okay. No, no, he uses deductive logic. Okay, I'm personally very fond of Tedak's work. It is analytical, it is honest. And it is precise. So he gives you the exact shlok and its interpretation. And wherever the shlok is vague, he ex explicitly says that, look, this is my interpretation. I'm probably wrong, but this is my interpretation. Whether you like it or not, you take it. Especially for evidence of 6000 BC, et cetera, they really become dicey. And he says openly that, look, this shlok is there, which I think should be interpreted like this. Most other translators have not interpreted it like that, but uh, this is my interpretation. You need not take it seriously. So he actually tells you, that this part is from this particular deductive logic. This is the observation. This is the shloka in which this thing is there. And this is the interpretation that seems most likely and the effort is correct. As he starts going from 2000 to 6000 BC, he actually tells you that, look, my evidence is now becoming weaker and therefore you should think twice before accepting it. And the 6000 BC uh, evidence is fairly frail. And he says it is very frail. So I'm personally, I, I mean, one of my great tragedies, I was born too late, but uh, it would have been a delightful thing to listen to Tirak. His honesty and integrity and his scholarship are phenomenal. That is why when he was in jail, Max Planck wrote to uh, the Indian government to have him freed because he was a great scholar who didn't deserve to be in a jail. But he's a man worthy of those honors. I have great respect for Tirak. Aryan uh, came all the way from the uh, North Pole to India. Yes. It, it stands true now? Um, I don't know whether I have time. I would love to go on, but um, by the way, the longest I've taken a lecture is four hours, so I can continue for another two. Um, there you can, we know human beings left from Africa. Then they go from Africa, they come to Palestine, um, and then from Palestine, they split. Okay, there's a great mountain range that separates Iran from Central Asia. And the Caspian Sea is at the edge of it. So at Caspian Sea, there's a split in people. Okay, we have actually done the simulation, so I'm speaking with so much confidence. And one group comes along, um, first they go to Mesopotamia, first they go to Iraq. 
where they settle down on uh, Tigris and Euphrates. Then they cross to Iran. There is a window around 10,000 BC when it was warm and wet. And they managed to migrate and they come through Bolan Pass in southern uh, Hindu Kush and come into Indian subcontinent. The second group, which is what I think Tikal Tilak is referring to, actually at Caspian Sea gets divided and goes all the way to 50 degrees north because the Caspian Sea is lengthwise. So it goes all the way to the north. And even though you don't get midnight sun there, which he claims there is a reference to, you get fairly late night suns. Um, you would get sunset around mid, uh, 11 o'clock at night or something at the peak of summer. And then they come down, they remain to the they remain in Central Asia. So they remain to the north of Iran. They go to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, eventually take Khyber Pass and come into India. Okay. So there are clearly two groups. So, uh, so um, Arctic itself may be an exaggeration, but certainly significantly larger latitude where they would see nearly midnight sun. Is, is not a bad description of this group that seemed to have come from top, which you can verify with modern simulation techniques. And we have done it ourselves. That's why I'm saying it with confidence. So Tilak was not completely right, but not completely wrong, probably. There is, so, and the question is of who do you call Aryans is a big question because Indians are a mix of Indo-Iranian and Indo-Europeans. And probably you refer to Indo-Europeans as Aryans and Indo-Iranians as, uh, as other community. We don't know. Genetically, we are more like Indo-Iranians than Indo-Europeans. But those are questions of politics and history, which I don't want to get into. But Tilak was not completely. I mean, Tilak is delightful to read because you know what intellectual honesty looks like. So this uh, tribal astronomy and temple astronomy, it's a very interesting topic and uh, ancient references are found in India. But is there a very systematic way we need to document it so that it comes yes. out? And very serious requirement. Very, very serious. I cannot emphasize this enough. And um, like I said, we have there are 400 tribes in India and we have done only 10. Okay. But see, and this knowledge is being completely washed off. So, for example, when we went to Andaman, and we look for their astronomical knowledge. They said, sorry, 90% of our elders were all washed away in the tsunami in 2000. And therefore, that knowledge is very weak. So the amount we could document was really very little compared to what must have existed 10 years ago. In other places, people are being sent to ashram schools and other schools, etc. And with, for all the advantages of modern education, they're forgetting their ancient knowledge. Many of them can't even speak their original Gondi language. Or and so this knowledge will be lost in a generation. And uh, some people will say, what do we lose if we lose it? Well, I think we lose a bit of ourselves if we lose it. I mean, you can't read Pula Deshpande in Hindi. There is no way. You have to read him in Marathi. So it's, it's precious knowledge and it's being lost. Yeah, surely. And there are so many temples have got such uh, references to... Uh, temples have, yes, temples have their own um, emphasis. First of all, temples, their origin itself is an interesting thing. They were original simple colors. But if you go to um, South India, especially, which is rich with temples, there are some temples that were designed only as simple colors. Somebody's urn is kept at the bottom and then the temple is built. Then the architecture is different. There's a whole manual on how to make temples in Dravida style and Nagara style. Nagara, Dravidian style is almost certainly a dropout from megaliths. Because if you look at megaliths and if you put four stones, the person sitting in the center will be able to tell you seasons. And probably the temple idea comes from there. How to build a temple, bring the cosmos down, take a megalithic design and put it into this. So Dravidian is closer to megalithic design. Then within the Dravidian and um, Nagara style, there are differences. Then there are temples that try, travel to West Asia, East, uh, Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is full of Harihara temples. It's something that is very rare in India because Hari, um, Vishnu and Hara, uh, Shiva, will not mix in Indian temples. Shaivite streams are different from Vaishnavite streams. Well, Southeast Asia is full of uh, Harihara temples and they're very well structured uh, temples, very beautifully made temples. And plus, like I said, there's Angkor Wat, one kilometer by 700 meters. You can't even begin to imagine it. And done with great precision of Vedic cosmology. So you actually have Mount Meru in the middle and then seven layers of heaven and then the great emptiness and so on. Um, and exactly 1,071 steps to reach the uh, Mount Meru from the start. So everything has been done with great law. And basically, Cambodia is rich with uh, 
beautiful Indian temple. So if you go to Bangkok airport, for example, the first thing you notice is Samudra Manthan right at the airport, a beautifully done architecture. And Samudra Manthan runs right through that part of the world. Lot needs to be studied, but they should be studied in an objective manner. What is currently being done gives a lot to be done. And I'll leave it at that. I don't want to expound on that statement. But somewhere along the line, our nationalism has got a better of our internet. Yes. Hello, sir. Uh, I want to ask about three famous temples of South. One is Padmanabh Swami Temple. One is Tirupati and one is Meenakshi Amman Temple at Madurai. Right. So there is a common difference which I have uh, noticed. You can't see the God there in uh, artificial lights, but only natural light. Uh, in Meenakshi Amman Temple, the sunlight direct comes. In Tirupati Temple, we can only see Balaji through that Deepa. And in Padmanabh Swami Temple, you can't see Padmanabh Swami with your whole eyes in a single stretch. Right. You have to see it in three parts that statue so what is a common thing between these three temples could you elaborate on that um okay in india there are no two temples which are same it depends on uh, the local cultural interest and so for example padmanabha is this idea of um, um, vishnu lying down on the uh, in, in the great lotus and the whole world tree. that is a primary image that is there in their head Meenakshi Mandir has um, megaliths and the idea of central place where the whoever was a learned man who could tell you about the future and uh, when the clouds were coming and what omens were there must have been their central emphasis. So each of them has a separate emphasis. There are temples, for example, um, yeah, um, I don't know if any have seen this movie called Haider, in which there is a song that is on the Shiva temple in Kashmir. Kashmir, Kashmir. Uh -huh, Kashmir ka Shiva temple. I forget. Um, I forget its name. But it's an exact replica of that Shiva temple. Something known as Shaitan Ki Gufa they have mentioned. No, 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 no Shaitan Ki Gufa. It's a, it's a proper um, Mahakaleshwar or some temple like that. I forget. It's in one of the names. Huh? Mahaka, Ma no, not Mahakaleshwar. Mahakaleshwar. I think it is Mahakaleshwar. That temple is actually not facing east or west. It is slightly inclined. And is inclined in such a way that the sunlight falls on the statue in the Garbhagra only at the beginning of harvesting. And it continues to illuminate till the end of harvesting. So the idea is that you take God's blessing and start your harvesting, continue your harvesting. And when God tells you to stop, you stop. So each temple has its own signature local belief, which goes into it. Because Hinduism goes from India to, um, to Southeast Asia in a relatively purer form of scholarly this thing, you have Ka Angkor Wat. In India, you cannot have Angkor Wat because the local belief systems will give you all kinds of things. But each temple has its own local belief system that goes into it. And that is why it is important to document each of these temples and study each of these temples separately because they have a broader common theme, which is, of course, the worship and a whole lot of internal things. So, for example, there is a temple, again, I forget, there's a circular temple in which there are 12 pillars with 12 zodiacal signs. And it is simply a myth that each of them is illuminated on different time of the year and so on, but it is not true. But somebody had this idea which did not work. So each temple has its own characteristics. On the other hand, that the broader design of the temple is designed. You want to start a temple, start with the stamba. Look at the directions. Decide which directions you want to have the opening on. And then go back and design the rest of the Mechanically, also temples are not so easy to make. And um, there, are, there are a lot of questions to why it is done, how it is done, and what are the broader beliefs and what are the local beliefs that have gone into making any temple. Even if you look at a local temple that your local pujari has made, he has made according to his own biases, his or her. Okay. And therefore, a temple in this part of Kalyan will be different from a temple further down because there's some other priest and some other ideas. Okay. I mean, the obvious theme differences of Ganpati, Hanuman, Vishnu, Shiva temples, Krishna Shiva temples. But apart from that, there are minor changes which are interesting. Temples are, are a delightful collection of local and global beliefs. And I know of at least one person who is studying only these. And if you some of the more expensive temples, which have this outer periphery of um, designs, for example, if you go to this Mahalakshmi temple at Kolhapur, the outer temple actually has the five Pandavas, um, five Pandavas as the Dwarpadas. And that doesn't seem to be true. Uh, but it has interesting systems. And I mean, 
I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, somebody at the back has a question. Marathi Pichago. No, we are. Oh, Panjanga was Pato. Shukra Tauday, who does a Lagno Ramai, Lagno Talavay, Kabuli, many. But how do you correct with astronomy? This particular Panjanga Java Litana, they are the local astronomy Bakta. Manje Kutla Graha, Kutli Dagala, Sil Kutla Dushi. That is fairly accurate. That kind of problem, right? But the Adishi Lagna Ka Naikarava, they Panjanga Sangat Natamala, Putunta Dushi Sangta. And to Topa Martunuski. But Panchanga Kotanaway, but Panchanga has an interpretation as to that's a full cell. Guru to Astotomi astronomy the Kai development as to Kai name Kai name a locomanta key eclipse mule, Putu, Suriaka Navita, current Kana raise yet at Vagere Kai name Surya like Kahi for a Padna Chandra shadow put a portoto. Kajitari Prudur Porto Kajitari Bahar Porto Telakai for a person, Surya Kai special design current and Kahata, Surya Karan, Chandra Chikiran, Chandra Shadow, Surya Putu or Portoe, Manu Mikatari Namin Kiran of Agar Bahar Kadu Sasledan. So Panchanga is accurate, Pantacha interpretation gone by. Any other question? And Panchanga Teloka, if you look at the introduction, they say we based it on Surya Siddhanta. Vagare. Surya Siddhanta, because it does not take precession, is actually out by a few hundred, for a few days now. Teloka Sagar, the Ephemeris Bhaktat, Indian Statistical Institute, and Panchanga Banata. But Sangat Netumada. So, we are not the Teloka Sangat Lamchi method, Egdam Secret, I am Mikuma Sangana. And the copy got that to him. Yes. Good morning, sir. I've heard that uh, Angkor Wat temples, it corresponds to the constellation Draco. Hmm. And Orion, the three stars of Orion, they exactly correspond to the, the great pyramids of Pisa. Huh, the pyramids of Pisa and Kin. They, they exactly, from the um, astrology point, they are made according to, and the, even the dimensions are based on the exact brightness of the, of the star. So um, the, the belief in that is that. Um, Whenever Orion was seen in the sky, Nile would flood. It's a coincidence. Can't they, uh, there would be higher sunlight in the upper reaches and therefore ice would melt and you would get a flooding. But it so happened that Orion was in the sky. So there is a school of belief which says that uh, the pyramids were made to worship Orion. And there are other evidences of worship of Orion. Can't they, uh, Orion would have flooded, I'd say. But how accurate it is, we don't know. There are other schools which say that is not true. But, but you are right that the brightness of the star and the size of the pyramids, yeah. at least of those three middle stars, seem to correspond. It's according to Osiris 1, 2, and 3. They are, yes. to... So there is there is some reason to believe that to be true, but it is not conclusive. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, before we conclude, I can just want to inform you that about 25 years back, we had conducted a tour to Dolavira, Kotara and Lothal. And it was Esar Rao who invented that Lothal, who was interacting with us and we had an advantage of interacting with him on those grounds. So uh, not only that, we have conducted tours to all South Indian temples from the point of view of astronomy, astrology and architecture both. So if you if you are interested now, uh, you can take some lead, we can give you some literature when we uh, prepared for those temples and other things. But uh, unless or until you visit that, especially Dolabira Kotada and uh, so-called Lothal, uh, that was a dock there. According to SR Rao, there was a very ancient dock there and so many other things. So you have to visit that. So the younger generation here, I can tell you, if you form the groups, uh, it is worth visiting those sites and we can help you on those grounds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayank Vahia, for talking us on a journey through the unique world of astronomy. Thank you, sir. Dr. Vana Bedekar Vyavasthapan Abhyaskram Saunstetse Mahasanchalak, Dr. Guru Prasad Murti Sarana, me upasthitan se abhar vannya chvinanti karto.
the honorable chairman dr vijay bedekar chairman vpm thane dr mayank vaya the chief guest of today i think in the last 15 years that i have been here i have never seen so many questions <laughs> as today and that bears eloquent testimony to the kind of stimuli that you have provided through your uh, session i thought of first talking about the way you made your session very interesting but it seems that the questions were more interesting people were more interested and i think if we had encouraged students they would have asked more questions thank you dr mayank vaya for answering these questions very patiently eagerly waiting for more questions and perhaps would have continued for some more time your uh, scholarship your excellence your fluid presentation is a lesson to many teachers as to how a presentation should be made and that stems from the deep sense of commitment and as you said perspiration i call it as the sweat of the brow unless there is the sweat of the brow but today in air conditioned environments i don't see the sweat of the brow and perhaps therefore people the perspiration portion has reduced and i don't know whether the inspiration has really increased but uh, i appreciate what you said about the perspiration and unless there is simple perspiration reading writing and dissertation on the part of teachers and students in that order we cannot see the outcomes that we saw today uh, big round of applause to the outstanding the simplicity the humility outstanding presentation and the patience with which he has answered all the questions and the provocation to students and teachers to ask questions once again i thank you very much and it's a great source of inspiration to many of us who want to draw some lessons from today's presentation we also come now to the fact that we are meeting every year on april 14th and we need to recall with pride glory and all the seminal contributions of dr v n bedekar and the band of like minded persons who came here into a marshy land and wanted to offer education to thane thanekars young boys of thane young boys and girls of thane one at some stage he saw dr v n bedekar saw according to the literature recorded young thane boys and girls going in local trains to a peripheral local place to attend a local college or local school i thought why should these boys and girls go there we should have all the facilities here that vision was converted into a missionary zeal and this marshy land was converted to start with into small educational centers i was told that the school was initially in a shed and then we had buildings we had a campus we had a marshy land converted into an educational hub of thane and eventually a habitat for thousands of students for hundreds of teachers i would not say employment hundreds of teachers for their way of life and several scores of people in various kinds of vocations being our stakeholders so that is the great seminal contribution of noble person noble thoughts that might have come to their mind particularly dr we and bedekar noble education is very sacred we worship education as lady saraswati in fact is known as saraswati mandir when we worship when we worship education it is sacred it's a uh, holy noble there cannot be any substitute for that sacredness and nobility and that's what we see in this hub today and today's questions bear testimony to the quality of education that we have provided to students and teachers and therefore uh, it's a day when we have to commemorate with proudful thanks awe and glory for the quality of education that this center is giving or this campus is giving quality has to be reinforced on two four scores one is our past one is our proposed future and last but not the least the national education policy which makes quality a way of life for education in the future in so far as vp mandal vpm is concerned quality is a motto it's a part of life it's part of our culture is part of our attitude is part of our belief is part of our predominant desiderata as it were 
And this is well reinforced by all the documentation that exists on VPM's motto with respect to quality education. And Dr. Vijay Bedekar stands by it as part of his policy in favor of education. And in favor of Dr. V. N. Bedekar and the band of friends that he had who came here, I can only say that lives of great men all remind us and leave behind us and leave behind for us footprints on the sands of time. It is the footprints of those sands of time that have contributed to this great hub, this great habitat. And I think it requires a big round of applause to VPM Thane and all the stakeholders. The new education policy has one important statement which I wish to read out to you. And then, as Dr. Maya also referred to it about astrology as one of the subjects. Uh, that is part of uh, the state document which talks of Indian values, heritage, culture, local design, local thoughts, local models, well interspersed with Western thoughts, tradition and mo modernity in juxtaposition, and new models to emerge in order to make India a great educational hub. By 2040, we are supposed to have Indian educational institutions, which are second to none. Let's see what they say in one of the paragraphs. Paragraph 11.4. A holistic, a holistic and multidisciplinary education as described so beautifully in India's past is indeed what is needed for the education of India to lead the country into the 21st century and the fourth industrial revolution. Even engineering institutions such as IITs will move towards more holistic and multidisciplinary education with more hearts and humanities. Students of arts and humanities will aim to learn more science and all will make an effort to incorporate more vocational subjects and soft skills. Apart from this one line, which makes a paradigm shift in our education policy, which concerns us is that in one of the paragraphs, it says very clearly, but unfortunately in some corner of the document, it should have been the very first line that students are the primary stakeholders of education. Students are the primary stakeholders of education. It's like a corporate saying, customers are the key factors in business. Students as primary stakeholders of education means education in different places, they have said should be optimistic, should be enjoyable, should be pleasant. The student should be happy here, taking subjects of his choice, whether it is building one, two, three, four or five, barring a modicum level of thinking for bringing about a common denomination among the students. Unless this happens, I don't think the new education policy will make any meaning. We have discussed this in Valenshwar, but this is the policy which is documented as a government of India thought on education. I commend this thought to you, sir, Dr. Bedekar, and hope that this uh, hub, educational hub, will be among the prime movers of this thought into action. I commend this thought to the teachers, to the heads of institutions, to all those who are present here as stakeholders of VPM Thane. Hearty vote of thanks to Dr. Maya once again. And I hope we have a chance to meeting you again, to listen to your uh, words of wisdom, not only on astronomy, but on mathematics and management, which are so closely related and with which you are concerned at NMIMS or were concerned at NMIMS. I thank Vidya Prasad Mandal for its contributions so far, and I hope we'll be part of a great future. And past was great, future will be glorious still, hopeful, hopefully, and certainly so. I commend these thoughts to you on this occasion and express a hearty vote of thanks to every stakeholder of VPM Tane who is present here and all those who have played a great part in making this function happen as usual. Our time schedule was disturbed only because of the large number of questions. Thanks to the stimuli of Dr. Maya. A big round of applause to all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maya. धन्यवाद कार्यक्रम समाप्त समय जाहिर करतो धन्यवाद